Hello and welcome. Welcome to everyone who is joining us on this webinar today. I want to thank you for joining us and uh, allow you to get comfortable with your Zoom screen as uh, I sort of situate us for the presentation today. My name is Trey Calvin. I'm the Communications Director for the Center for Applied Linguistics, as well as the Center for the Success of English Learners, which I'll be talking more about today. Um, so thank you for joining IES, Cal, and Cecil for this 60 minute panel presentation on the topic of how policy affects access to learning for English learners. This webinar is being recorded um, and will be posted on CecilCenter.org immediately following this event. The Center for the Success of English Learners, or CECL, is providing this event as a public service. However, the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed solely belong to the persons expressing them and do not necessarily represent the views of CECL. Uh, today, we are joined by esteemed experts in their field who work at the intersection of research policy and practice of the education of multilingual learners, uh, and English learners in particular. We're very lucky to have so much knowledge on this call and we encourage you, the audience members, to ask us questions at any time via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will try to address as many questions as we can at the end of our presentation and we've allotted about 20 minutes or so towards the end for your questions. Please enter them at any time. Also, you can click on the chat button also located at the bottom of your screen. Um, and share your thoughts and comments throughout the presentation. You can go ahead and try it out now. Go ahead and tell us where you're calling in from today. Uh, while you're doing that, just a little bit of background about CECL, and then I'll turn it over uh, to my guests. Uh, the uh, Center for Success of English Learners is an IES-funded research center identifying and testing transdisciplinary approaches to improve opportunities and outcomes for English learners. It is supported by the Institute of Education Sciences at the U.S. Department of Education through a grant uh, awarded at the University of Houston, Texas. The opinions expressed are those of the authors who do not represent the views of the Institute or the U.S. Department of Education. Finally, before we begin, make sure your microphones are muted and your video off so that we can avoid any interruptions during the presentation. Now I'd like to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Helen Kim who is the research, uh, sorry, the Education Research Analyst at the National Center for Education uh, Research, which is housed in the US Department of Education. Helen is an early childhood and education researcher with over 10 years of experience in understanding mechanisms that link developmental skills to achievement and classroom behaviors. She's gonna tell us a little bit about IES and a little about what she does. Helen, thank you so much for your time today and joining us. Thanks, Trey, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Trey mentioned, my name is Helen Kim, and I am um, the program officer managing the English learners portfolio at IES. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and to welcome you all to today's webinar. Um, I'm also very uh, happy to be here to support CECL, or the Center for the Success of English Learners. Um, as Trey uh, mentioned earlier, CECL is one of two R&D centers that were funded by IES in 2020 to better understand the systemic and instructional influences that affect education for English learners, um, specifically in secondary school settings. And rather than discussing the specific work that CECL is doing, which you will hear directly from the team throughout this webinar series, um, I want to share with you why it was important to IES that we invest in these two centers. For those of you who are not familiar, IES was established in 2002 and is the independent research, evaluation, and statistics arm of the US Department of Education. We are nonpartisan by law, so we are not involved in the policymaking process. Rather, IES is charged with providing rigorous and relevant research to inform education practice and policy. We are also charged with sharing this information broadly. We want to disseminate what works, but we also want to understand what doesn't work and why in order to help improve education outcomes for all students. English learners have always been a priority for IES, but starting in 2010, we decided to explicitly direct attention to the specific population of learners by creating the English learners portfolio. Since then, IES has invested over $100 million to support over 50 research projects on English learners. 
These projects have examined a variety of topic areas in different states across the US and across a large range of grade levels and contexts. However, when looking back at these research projects that we funded over the years, there seemed to be a lack of research on English learners, um, specifically in secondary school settings. Much of the work we have funded so far has focused on elementary age students. However, as we are aware, many English learners in secondary school settings face unique challenges and numerous barriers in accessing education opportunities. And of course, in many cases, this has led to persistent differences in academic outcomes between those identified as English learners and non-English learners, as well as long-term implications that reach far beyond school. And this is where we see the two R&D play centers playing a major role. IES's goal for these centers is to create innovative solutions, contribute to knowledge and theory, and provide reliable, nuanced, and actionable information about how to improve education for English learners, both in secondary school settings and more generally. These centers are not looking at just one specific area or trying to answer one research question, but are in fact tackling a complex problem at multiple levels of the system and at greater scale than a typical research project that we support through our education research grant program. Both of these R&D centers are composed of experts and leaders in the field who are deliberately and carefully coordinating and collaborating across many different organizations and institutions to more productively leverage the work they are doing and move the field forward. Cecil is led by Dr. David Francis at the University of Houston, and he has built an excellent team of researchers from all over the country. Their sister R&D center is led by Dr. Aida Walkie at West Ed, whom you will hear from in a bit. I feel really fortunate to be here and to be working closely with these centers as they individually and collectively engage in a research program aimed at improving current instructional practices and generating insights about policy levers and system level practices that have the potential to improve access and education outcomes for all English learners. The work that is being done is critically important and I believe their leadership in the field is needed now more than ever. We are living in what I would consider the new normal, which has forced us to think about new, different, and more effective ways to serve our students. It has been a challenging couple of years to say the least, but so much has been accomplished already. I'm really excited to see how the centers will continue to adapt and respond to the current needs of practitioners, policymakers, students, and their communities to ensure that equitable educational access and high quality learning opportunities are happening for all English learners, particularly those in secondary school settings. Um, next up, I want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Aida Walkie, the director of their sister R&D Center, the National Research and Development Center for Improving the Education of English Learners in Secondary Schools um, housed at West Ed. Dr. Walkie will be providing more detail about the work that the two centers are doing and how they are working separately and together to achieve the center goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen, for that introduction to the absolutely essential task that both Cecil and the center that I lead are involved in. As I'm sure everybody attending this webinar knows, in the presence of English learners in our schools nationwide keeps growing. And especially the presence of English learners in secondary schools and a subset of them, students who have fallen into the category of long-term English learners because they have been in the category for six or more years. That in itself, calls attention to the fact that we are simply not serving those students right. There is no reason why students should be attending schools in America for six, seven, eight, or nine years and still remain in the category as English learners because they cannot pass proficiency tests in language, English language arts, and mathematics. So it was really a wonderful surprise to hear that IES had the wisdom to grant 
two applications. You know, every time, I'm sure many of you know, when you're applying for a center such as this, you are hoping you make it and you are kind of quietly hoping others don't uh, because others making it means that your portfolio of work is not being granted the opportunity to develop and contribute to the solution of these very urgent issues. But this time we had the most wonderful surprise that two uh, proposals had been granted. The proposal given to Cecil under the direction of David Francis and the proposal that a number of colleagues and I devised to serve the West. And it was almost serendipity because we actually did not coordinate before that we should have parallel agendas and portfolios, but emphasizing different aspects of the work. So for example, CISL has policy work about which we will hear much more in detail today. Uh, and we have policy work, but while ours looks at, for example, the existence of co-teaching, what it means, and as you said, Helen, when it works and when it doesn't work, because we can learn both from successes, but if we don't learn from failures, we really are in trouble. And so we are doing that and we're doing trajectories. But what was really exciting is that CISO in their portfolio has the development of materials that present a different vision for the simultaneous development of conceptual, uh, analytic and language skills in middle school in science and in social studies. And we have a similar development in curriculum with the difference that ours is educative in the sense that the curriculum itself has as one of its main goals to develop the expertise of teachers and to develop the awareness and autonomy of students that go through it. So we add math and English language arts. And there we have together the four most important subject matters for English learners. Uh, furthermore, both of us are working on the development of formative assessment with once again slightly different uh, perspectives. And we are working on proposing a reconceptualization of the whole assessment system. So we have started collaborating, but look forward to collaborating much more because the stronger we are with our diverse findings and recommendations, the more we will be able to together contribute to the field. So I want to introduce our two CISL colleagues who are going to be doing the presentation today. Uh, David Francis, of course, Dr. David Francis, has an incredible curriculum. As I was sharing with him before this session, it's always lovely to have to introduce a colleague that you know somehow caged in a corner, but uh, reading his CV, I realized that actually the corner was only a very small piece of who David is. And from my perspective, as an educator, a pedagogue, and somebody who has always worried about education, not just being equitable, but mainly being quality, the greatest uh, honor that David brings to the table is that he actually was the recipient of an excellence in teaching award from the University of Houston. So besides that, he is a wonderful quantitative uh, person and he directs also the Texas Institute for Measurement, Evaluation and Statistics, also housed at the University of Houston and multiple other research centers that it really would take way too long. And we want to hear from him rather than hearing uh, about who, uh, what his record is. But I think I will read these three aspects that to me, I want to learn much more. So I look forward to hearing about it. He is a specialist in the modeling of individual growth, 
And of course, we are all after student growth. So definitely an area where I need to go deeper. Item response theory and explanatory data analysis. So David, I will have in conversations with you about these topics. But let's move on to Michael Kiefer. Michael is somebody that I had noticed at ARA on several occasions and attended his sessions. But what I didn't know, once again, is that he had been an English language arts middle school teacher. And so there is that very intimate connection to learning and how teachers promote that learning rather than teaching. So those awards need to be renamed somehow. But in any case, Michael leads CISO's uh, area of policy and systems level studies. And uh, he is very interested in how, what is the connection between policy? How does policy both enhance and constrain practices for English learners? And I'm sure the other way around as well, right? How practice in the best of situations informs what the policies need to be. So without further ado, uh, I will let our two wonderful colleagues share their presentation with us. Thank you, Aida. <clears throat> So uh, good afternoon and um, thank you all for joining us today for the first of our uh, planned CISO webinars for 2022. I'd like to start by thanking Helen and Aida for their participation today and for those lovely introductions of the centers and our, our, our team, but also for their contributions to our center through our working meetings together and our collaborations. In my remarks today, I'm hoping to give you an overview of the Center for the Success of English Learners while setting the stage for today's webinar from our policy strand, as well as our planned webinars on academic language and content area instruction that are going to follow later this spring. I'll be joined today by uh, Michael Kiefer, the leader of our policy strand, where we are focused on identifying, removing the hard and soft barriers that operate to keep English learners from accessing challenging grade level courses. And in addition to Michael, uh, Dr. Kristen Black will be joining us. She is a postdoctoral fellow at NYU and Dr. Colleen Carlson, who is a research assistant professor at the University of Houston. They're both here to participate in the panel discussion as they were both uh, very instrumental in the work that uh, Michael will be presenting. So the, the work of our policy center is really the focus of our webinar today. And I really look forward to uh, joining Michael and uh, Kristen and Colleen in that conversation. So our center is a collaboration across multiple institutions, specifically the University of Houston, the University of Texas at Austin. We're headed up by uh, Dr. Sharon Vaughn, who directs the research on social studies instruction. New York University, headed up by Michael uh, at the Center for Applied Linguistics, where Dr. Joel Gomez directs the strand on leadership and dissemination. And uh, Dr. Diane August directs our research on science instruction. And we're also assisted by the Strategic Education Research Partnership, which is headed up by Dr. Suzanne Donovan. Suzanne and Dr. Catherine Snow from the Harvard Graduate School of Education are collaborating through SERP in our uh, social studies and science instructional strands. And when we began our work, Dr. Lorena Yosa at NYU was leading up our team's efforts in formative assessment. And although she's had to step back from directing those efforts on formative assessment, she continues to provide important leadership in that area for us. The overarching goal of our center is really to improve educational outcomes for English learners in middle and high school, primarily in the areas of science and social studies. And although we expect that the, uh, the focus of our work will also lead to improved outcomes uh, in language as well as in reading language arts because of the nature of the focus on language learning through content. In proposing our center, we drew very heavily on two recent consensus committee reports from the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, uh, one of which I actually had the opportunity and the pleasure to chair. <clears throat> To achieve our goals, we propose to leverage several important instructional strategies that we have dubbed transdisciplinary strategies 
because they're expected to work across academic disciplines such as science and engineering, social studies, mathematics, and reading and language arts. The major strategies are listed on this uh, particular slide, but I'm not going to elaborate on them further today as they really serve as the focus of the future webinars that we have planned for later in the spring, where we focus on our instructional strand of the center. And I look forward to those and I hope that you'll be able to join us when we get to that point. So I'm sure as you as I'm sure you've gathered by now, there are two major research strands within the center, one focused on improving instruction so that it both challenges and supports English learners in meeting the demands of grade level content area learning. Of course, designing content area instruction to challenge and support English learners can only have the desired impact if those students are actually in the classroom. And thus the research of our policy strand focuses on identifying and removing barriers to participation in grade level content area instruction. Shortly, uh, Michael will be taking our, talking about our work that examines archival data on course taking in science and mathematics. And that work was recently presented at the IES principal investigator meeting this January by uh, Dr. Black, uh, who also joins us today. But before he does that, I would like to take a few minutes to share some comments from my presentation at the IES uh, principal investigator meeting where I was asked to talk about uh, diversity and inclusion in education research. And I'd like to share this perspective with you because I believe it plays a role in shaping the work of our center in at least two ways. First, it highlights the diversity that exists within the English learner population, not just across the population, but within individual families, even within given individuals as they develop over time from being young children to being young adults. Second, this work uh, highlights the crucial role that language development plays in achievement and the symbiosis that exists between these constructs. Knowledge and language develop together, not in tandem, with one leading and the other following dutifully behind. And that's, the, that's what we're trying to leverage in our instruction as well as in our policy studies, this sort of co-development of language and content. So education is unique if for no other reason that we all have our own experience with learning and most of us have some experience trying to learn from inside an education system. For better and for worse, these experiences shape our thinking, our attitudes, beliefs, and our feelings about education. As education researchers and as educators, we're aware of and we work to overcome the operation of these forces, but we're really not immune to them. Like all of you, important aspects of my background have shaped my perspectives on education, which I see unequivocally as a force for good in the United States, albeit an imperfect one. My grandfather was born in Venezuela, but I'm not Hispanic. My father would have been considered a language minority student because his parents spoke Arabic in the home. He would have also been considered an initially fluent English proficient language minority student as he spoke only English his entire life. Of course, he was born in 1928 and he went to school at a time that predated such ideas by at least several decades. My father was the fourth oldest male child in his family, but the first to attend school past grade eight, despite his mother's asking him uh, to quit school to help support the family. Rather, he worked after school and became the first person in his family to graduate from high school, a decision that he made that significantly shaped the course of his own life as well as the lives of his children. Well, when we think about diversity, often the only thing that comes to mind is differences between groups that we identify along racial, cultural, ethnic, or gender boundaries. But perhaps what should come to mind are the substantial differences between people who are similar to one another on these easily identifiable demographic features. What made my father different that he valued education in a way that his parents and older siblings did not? When I asked him about it, he did not identify a specific person or influence in his life as the source of this insight. What research has made clear and which no one disputes is that children from children growing up in the same family are very different from one another. In education, the conversation about diversity will be strengthened when we move beyond group mean differences and focus instead on within group heterogeneity, individual differences and understanding students as individuals not as interchangeable members of groups. 
We want to encourage you to view what we present today from a lens of individual differences within groups and not focus exclusively on the differences and similarities between groups. As educators, we really want to reach each child, not just the average child in each group. Although all student subgroups are collections of diverse individuals, today we're here to focus and discuss English learners, and it's uh, worth taking a moment to consider the many ways in which English learners differ from one another, many of which shape students' educational experiences, and some of which are a result of their different educational experiences. It's well known that English learners come from a diversity of linguistic backgrounds or somewhat over 300 uh, home languages that are spoken in the US. They come from all socioeconomic uh, classes, although they are disproportionately represented among lower socioeconomic status groups in the country. They vary in terms of their years of experience in US schools, although most English learners enter US schools in kindergarten. In spite of that, many students enter U.S. schools in later years, including up through high school. Uh, moreover, students who have not received all of their education in U.S. schools can't be assumed to have had formal schooling outside the U.S., nor they can, can they be assumed to have had uninterrupted schooling, whether inside or outside of the U.S. And of course, students differ in their language proficiency in English, as well as in their home languages, they differ in their literacy in English, as well as in their home languages, and they differ in the time that they will need to develop proficiency in English, in part due to difference in, differences in students' educational experiences, but also due to differences in students' facility with learning language, which interacts with their experiences in school. <clears throat> At the same time that English learners uh, differ from one another, the English learner category is really unlike any other educational subgroup because membership in the English learner category is expected to be temporary and it's based on an attribute of student cognition that's developmental in nature, it is the focus of schooling, and it's actually causally implicated in student achievement. As a country, we made attempts to address this issue by allowing students to count as English learners for some specified number of years after attaining proficiency in English. But the fa that fact remains that the majority of students who begin school as English learners become proficient in English and are no longer counted in the English learner category as they continue to develop skills and more advanced proficiency in English. These characteristics of the English learner category have led Sa uh, uh, Saunders and Marcelletti in 2014 to characterize the gap in English per learner performance as the gap that cannot go away. And while there's utility in comparing the performance of English learners to the performance of non-English learners to understand if we are serving uh, students well while they are English learners, these comparisons don't tell us the whole story about how well or how poorly we are serving our English learners, as they only tell us how English learners are faring while they are not yet proficient in English. But when researchers and educators have looked at outcomes for students who began school as English learners, they actually see a much improved picture for English learners. For English learners who achieve proficiency in English within five or six years of entering U.S. schools, outcomes appear quite comparable to those who were never English learners and, in fact, often are superior. What makes these issues so challenging is that language ability is a determinant of academic achievement. And here I'm talking about an individual's language abilities, not their proficiency in any particular language. That language ability is a determinant of academic achievement is true no matter what area of academic achievement we look at, whether it's reading language arts, mathematics, science, social studies, any other academic domain. That language ability is distinct from one's proficiency in a specific language is not controversial, but we, we rarely take time to discuss it. In one's native language, it's really hard to differentiate these two constructs, that is someone's ability in a language and their proficiency. But they're not hard to distinguish when we think about proficiency in a second or a third language that one is attempting to learn and we think about a person's ability uh, as in terms of language ability to be able to learn and become proficient in that other language. 
On this page, this chart shows a breakdown in the variability in math and English language arts achievement scores for English learners at the student, school, and district level for fourth through eighth grade for a state that's widely recognized for its success in educating English learners. And you can readily see that there is substantial variability in achievement at the student level, or you know, maybe anywhere from 60 to 80%, 70%. <clears throat> but also at the significant variability at the school and district level, indicating differences between schools and districts in terms of these student level outcomes. If we take into consideration the level of English proficiency of individual students, much of the variance in achievement at the school and district level is reduced. The table on the present slide shows the reduction in the variance at the school and district level by including students language proficiency classification so just what level of proficiency students are at. We could actually achieve a greater reduction in variability at the district and school level if we included or took into account students actual performance on the language proficiency measure so their scale scores on uh, reading and writing and speaking and listening. Thus, the point of this is that at least part of the differences in the achievement of English learners across schools and districts is due to differences in the distribution of their English learners language proficiency scores. So the differences in language proficiency distributions across schools and districts. Generally, this table shows that the differences in student proficiency account for more of the variance at the district and school level in English language arts than in mathematics but they still account for a substantial portion of the variability in mathematics. It's also true that the proportion of variance accounted for at the school level in English language arts is somewhat greater in grades seven and eight compared to earlier grades. Now, whether these differences are due to programming differences that lead to more protracted development of English proficiency for some schools and districts compared to others, differences in approaches to content area instruction, or differences in school composition with respect to the, the number and percentage of beginning level English learners versus more advanced English learners really can't be determined from the data that we have available here. But what is important to point out is that some of these factors are under the control of schools and districts, whereas others are not, such as the influx of students who come in at different levels of language proficiency from one year to the next. Well, one of the dimensions along which English learners differ from one another is their time in US schools. These figures show the relationship of years in the US to achievement as well as English language proficiency. The scale for English language arts and mathematics here is different from the scale for the English language proficiency assessment, which accounts for the separation in the lines. The blue line at the top is performance in English language proficiency as a, as a function of years in the US and the ones at the bottom are the uh, English language arts and mathematics. <clears throat> so to a some extent, the, diff the reason those lines are separated is because of the scale differences in the two scales. Uh, but what is apparent here is that time in the US appears to be more strongly related to differences in English language proficiency than to differences in mathematics or English language arts. Now, some of this difference is due to the scale differences, but not all of it, because if we adjust for the scale differences, the difference in English language proficiency are still about three times larger than that for math and six times larger than that for English language arts when we compare students in a given grade who differ in years in the US from one year to five years. Importantly, if we include years in the US in a model for English language arts or mathematics achievement, it really has very little impact on reducing variability at the school and district level or at the, even at the student level. So the weak of these weak effects in of years in the US are perhaps more apparent if we actually look at the entire distribution of performance for English language arts and mathematics. So on this slide, we have histograms, and these histograms show the actual distribution of English language arts in the left-hand panel and mathematics in the right-hand graph. Each column in these uh, figures shows the data for a single grade, with fourth grade being at the far left and eighth grade being at the right. And the rows of the graph uh, reflect years in the US, with one being at the bottom row and five plus years in the top row. Thus, as you sort of move from the bottom row to the top row, you can see the influence of years in the US, which is not very much. 
If years in the US had a strong influence on scores, the histograms would be more compact and they would sort of move to the right as we go from one year to five years. So as you move from the bottom uh, row up to the top row within a column, the entire distribution would sort of shift to the right. But you can see that that really doesn't happen very much. The distribution shift very little. So these findings simply serve to make the case for how we conceptualize the work of our center. We know that English learner students differ substantially from one another in many respects. Some of these factors may help us understand differences at a group level, and others may be important for some individual students, but not so important for the collection of students, things like years in the US. Maybe that's important for a given student, but not so important for students in general. We also know that there's a tight connection between language learning and content area knowledge development, and that students are best served when these two things can be integrated. We learn language when we engage with content that's interesting and important to us. But in order to engage with grade level content, students have to be in the classroom and the classroom has to be set up in a way to both challenge students and support them in their efforts to master the content given where they are in their language and content development at that point in time. What I've attempted to show you is that English learner students are quite different from one another. I would further assert that these differences are meaningful to the students, to their families, and to the students' education. These individual differences are often underappreciated in research and in instruction, and that needs to change. For English learners, a major source of individual differences is English proficiency, and that varies within children over time as children develop proficiency, but also between children at any given time. We have to do a better job of accounting for language proficiency and its effects in comparing uh, in comparisons involving English learners if we're ever to make reasonable inferences about students' educational development. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Michael to talk specifically about uh, taking uh, uh, course taking among our English learners. Thank you. Great. Right. Thanks, David. Um, and uh, thank you, Aida, for that lovely introduction. Um, as Aida said, I started my career as a middle school teacher and all of my students were multilingual learners. And so I've been really committed not just to improving instruction for these learners, but to also think about the systems that surround that instruction and the ways in which policy can shape and be shaped by, as Aida said, um, the practices that happen in the classroom. So today we're gonna, so now I'm gonna zoom in a little bit thinking about David's comments about heterogeneity and diversity of this population. We're going to zoom in a little bit thinking about math course taking in particular in middle school and high school, uh, drawing on some current work in using large data sets from both New York City and the greater Houston area. As David mentioned, this work is really being led by Kristen Black um, in close collaboration with Colleen Carlson and with David. Um, and so I definitely want to give credit to the, to the hard work they've done in putting these things together and pushing this study forward. So I'm going to talk about math course taking, but it's in the context of our larger program of research, which is uh, thinking about access to the core curriculum, as well as linguistic segregation as two major kind of features of the experience of English learners in middle schools and high schools. So we're thinking about those two factors. We're thinking about how those factors are influenced or predicted by barriers to English learners content achievement or barriers to content participation. So those are a variety of factors from educator attitude, attitudes to school practices to broader policies that constrain uh, course taking in certain ways. So we're involved, for instance, in focus group work and developing a large scale survey to get at those barriers. And then on the right hand side of this model, we're interested in how limited access to the core curriculum and linguistic segregation then predict a variety of outcomes. So thinking about content achievement and English language proficiency, but also thinking about more life outcomes like high school graduation and post-secondary enrollment. Today, and much of our current work has been is focusing in on this issue of limited access to the general curriculum. So in particular, I'm gonna talk about advanced math course taking in the high school. So why should we think about math and English learners? So as David said, we know that language is intricately uh, intertwined with content learning, including in mathematics. Uh, we know that English learners perform substantially worse than non-English learners in mathematics, raising questions about the role of language in math, but also questions about opportunities to learn math. So the opportunities that 
the ways in which opportunities to learn are structured for English learners and non-English learners and there are opportunities to learn and deal with sophisticated content. We know from uh, past research that math follows a linear sequence with a key role for early algebra that sets students on a certain pathway. We know similarly that algebra two is important for post-secondary access and success. We also know from some recent work done by folks like Karen Thompson, who I think is here, um, Ilana Umansky and Ilana Umansky, both of whom are also affiliated with the center that Aida described, our sister center, uh, as well as Angela Johnson. We know from this recent work by these folks that English learners are excluded from advanced math course taking, um, that in many ways, we're not seeing the kind of access that we would like to see. We're also seeing that English learners are very diverse in their language proficiency, as David described, and their academic preparation for math courses and in ultimately in their content access. So our particular research questions were first, how do English learners patterns of math course taking in high school differ from those of non-English learners? So what do we see? Do we see differences in access? Second, to what extent are these differences explained by student characteristics and by earlier academic achievement? So one question here is how much of this is a high school story or a high school issue? And how much of this is about students' earlier opportunities to learn and their cumulative academic achievement before they enter high school? And then finally, are there differences between New York City and the greater Houston metropolitan area in these course taking patterns? So of course, there are lots of differences between two sites, any two sites that you choose, um, two large urban areas are gonna have differences in their context, differences in their socio-demographics and so forth. Um, but they also have differences in policies that may structure and constrain opportunities in certain ways. So we're looking kind of speculatively at those things. In terms of relevant policies, there's a few things to note. Um, so first, both of our sites have Algebra 1 as a sort of de facto requirement in ninth grade if students haven't taken it before ninth grade. Um, in New York City, however, high schools have the option often to allow students to spread out ninth grade over two years and to have students receive, take Algebra 1 really for two years and to, for that to count. Um, students routinely seem to use this allowance for students that they deem at risk, including many English learners is what we've heard from district folks. Also in both sites, geom geometry is required for high school graduation. However, in Texas, it's also a prerequisite for many STEM courses, including Algebra 2, and those are in turn are necessary for a lot of things, including having an endorsement on one's diploma, which is something that all students are sort of encouraged to get. In terms of the analyses, we um, looked, we're looking at first time ninth graders uh, in New York. These are first time ninth graders from 2014 to 2016. In Houston, this is, these are students from 2016, one cohort. These are students who have seventh or eighth grade enrollment records. So as I mentioned, we're interested in looking at their earlier achievements. So we need students with middle school who were enrolled in middle school. Although we've done some robustness checks that I can talk about if people are interested for students who are new in ninth grade. And we're most interested in thinking about subgroups of non-English learners and English learners. So what does that mean? For non-English learners, there are sort of three subgroups of students. There are students who are English only, so don't speak a language other than English at home. There are students who are never English learners because they are initially fluent English proficient. So that's this IFEP phrase means that they, when entering the system, they tested proficient on the proficiency test. And then there are former English learners who were served in the system for some period of time, but at some point before ninth grade are classified as former English learners have been reclassified uh, as proficient. Then if we think about current English learners here in the purple, so this color scheme is gonna go throughout that blue will be non-English learners and purple will be current English learners. We think about three subgroups based on their time in the US. So newcomers who've been here one to three years, developing students who've been four to six years and long-term students who've been seven or more years. When we look at the two samples, um, as I mentioned, the New York City sample is, is a bit larger because it's three cohorts, um, but they're both quite large samples of students. Uh, we might notice that, and in both cases, the English only students are a slight majority, although a slight majority, there's still a huge, a, a large number of students who are multilingual. Um, we see slightly higher numbers of IFEP students in New York, slightly higher numbers of former English learners in Houston. Um, we see more newcomers in New York and we see more long-term English learners in Houston. Although at least in that last category, that may, that may be due to differences in the population and the demographics. It may also be due to differences in reclassification criteria, which I can talk more about. But essentially uh, in Texas, in order to become reclassified, you need to not only pass the English proficiency test, but also meet a certain level on the English language arts test, an English language arts standardized test. That's not required in New York City, which means that 
um, students who are in a kind of relatively high performing area are getting reclassified in New York when they're not in Houston. So some descriptive findings. And I know I'm running a little low on time, but I live in New York so I can talk fast. Um, we have, we look at algebra. And so this plot is the percent of students who, are, who have taken the course. Um, and then the, if you look at the bottom of the graph, it tells you by which grade. So these are, this is by grade eight, taking algebra one. And what we see are that about 30% of English only and former, L, former English learners take algebra in grade eight, while more than 40% of students who are IFEP do. However, the story is quite different for current English learners. So here the current English learners are in purple, the three subgroups, and current English learners overall are far less likely to take algebra one in grade eight than all groups of non-English learners. When we turn to grade nine, pretty much everyone takes algebra by the end of grade nine. So as I mentioned, this is sort of a de facto requirement. So we see very high rates of taking um, of algebra by, by ninth grade. If we turn to geometry, so now we see algebra there and then we see geometry by ninth grade, we see a very similar pattern to algebra by eighth grade. So we see a clear pathway here or a, or a linear sequence where students are enrolling in algebra one in eighth grade and then in geometry in ninth grade about similar, very similar numbers. Looking through later years uh, for geometry, Cornell's still that same pattern where they're at pretty low levels relative to the non-English learners. However, by about 11th grade, we see a little bit of catching up, particularly for the newcomers and developing English learners. They're starting to catch up with English only students by about 11th grade. Uh, and then if we look at algebra and trigonometry, we see that um, newcomer English learners, interestingly, begin to catch up with their English only peers by the end of 12th grade. So, by the, so they may need a little more time and take it a little later, but they do seem to be starting to catch up. That's not the story for long-term English learners who Aida mentioned earlier as a group that as an educational system, we may be particularly failing. Uh, Long-term English learners remain at a substantial disadvantage for having access to algebra two, which as we mentioned, is really important for post-secondary success. We look across the two sites, we see a very similar pattern for algebra one, but we see a very different pattern for geometry. So we see much higher rates of um, access to geometry by grade 10 uh, in Houston than we see in New York. So these are something like 25% percentage point differences. So these are big differences. Um, algebra two as a result. So, so after taking geometry, sort of then getting into algebra two, similarly, Houston English learners take algebra two somewhat earlier. They seem to be taking it earlier in the sequence. And we see similar patterns for pre-calculus and calculus. So I'll just briefly hit on a couple explanatory findings. So our explanatory models are asking what predicts algebra two and beyond. Uh, so we're looking at the outcome is taking any course in algebra two, pre-calculus or calculus by the end of grade 12, by the end of high school. We're controlling for student characteristics here. So gender, race, ethnicity, poverty, and special education status. And we're looking at, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at achievement, some achievement variables from grade eight to see if how early this, um, how, how important earlier preparation is. So we're looking at course and exam taking, whether they took algebra early, whether they took the algebra test early. Um, and then we're looking at their grade eight math score or grade seven in some cases. What we see for New York is similar to what I've shown before, our long-term English learners. Uh, so that's the lightest purple. Um, that group is, is, has quite, quite a bit lower probability of taking algebra two or beyond. Uh, when we turn to Houston, we see for all four groups, Houston students are have greater access to advanced math course taking. So it's clearly something going on there. It's quite an interesting picture. If you look at the long-term English learners, this is a big difference here. Um, and so it raises a lot of questions about sort of what is happening in Houston that's not happening in New York. But if you compare this graph, which is just looking at sort of the world as it is without controlling for any variables, and then you control for student characteristics as well as grade eight math achievement, you see these squares got a lot closer to each other, right? So that's because students' performance when controlling for and accounting for their prior achievement um, are much more similar. So this tells us that the story doesn't just start in high school, but that there's, there are issues around opportunities to learn and students' ability to achieve in math prior to their entry to high school that's gonna be really important here. So just quickly main findings and then I'll, we'll open it up to questions. So geometry matters. Um, in some sense, these findings suggest geometry is the new algebra that by having access to 
geometry, uh, students get into algebra two and sort of can move forward. Earlier preparation matters, as I've mentioned, prior achievement it explains a lot of these differences. I'd also mentioned it explains a lot of the differences between the two sites as well, which suggests that there may be many interesting things going on in middle schools that are different. And then finally, for long-term English learners, there's a striking difference in the course taking pattern for long-term English learners in the two cities. Um, and policies may matter here, but as I mentioned, reclassification criteria may matter quite a bit as well, um, in part because students in Texas have to reach a higher bar for achievement, at least English language arts achievement, uh, before they can be reclassified. So more students who are kind of at a marginal level of achievement may be um, still classified as English learners, long-term English learners, uh, whereas that's not the case in New York. Uh, so just throw this up one more time. This is our overall logic model. We're interested in all of these aspects and how they interrelate and doing a variety of ongoing work that I can talk about if people are interested. Um, just thanks to the Research Alliance for New York City Schools at NYU and the Educational Research Center at the University of Houston to facilitate our access to the data and to their technical support. Thanks to the New York City Department of Education Division of Multilingual Learners who have been really helpful in helping us think through this work. And then thanks to the Institute of Educational Sciences for funding this work. And with that, I will open it up to, I will turn over to Trey to moderate our questions. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, David, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, it's always great to be able to see the slides, especially because data really is beautiful. Um, and it was really nice to see that visualized there. I want to first touch on a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, at some point, a question, this goes to you, Dr. Francis. Uh, at some point, would it be possible to summarize the hard and soft barriers to ELs that were referenced uh, by you in your presentation? Uh, I, yeah, at some point, we will be able to talk about those. We are planning some survey work to try to get at things like attitudes towards students that we would classify as a soft barrier. Whereas hard barriers might be things like language proficiency requirements that prevent students from taking certain content area courses if they haven't achieved a certain level of, achieve, of proficiency on an English language proficiency test or prerequisites that might be unnecessary that uh, would actually prevent students from taking classes. And if those prerequisite requirements were relaxed that it might uh, open things up or is what we think we're seeing in Houston that in fact creating a requirement for students to take a class might actually foster their likelihood of uh, you know doing it and then uh, also being able to advance to other courses so hard barriers might be things like policies and practices that are uh, written in code that that then prevent students but the soft barriers are things like attitudes and uh, motivations that we think might also be operating that we're trying to understand. And although we don't have data on those just yet, we will as a part of the work of the center. I don't know if Michael would like to add anything to the soft barriers that we're sort of anticipating uh, trying to get information on. No, I think that was great. And speaking of more hard barriers to this level of, of, of access and um, and the education of L's. I have another question from Thomas Medina. Thank you, Thomas. He says, how might the role of content instruction in a learner's L1 affect student outcomes? Well, we think that's really crucial and that's partly why we see the policy work as so instrumental and the instruction, you know, to the instructional work, but also the instructional work is so instrumental to the policy work. These things, you know, feed off each other and support one another. And in a classroom where the teacher doesn't have, uh, isn't trained in the right ways to support English learners at different levels of proficiency, a student with low levels of proficiency might struggle to access the content where with a different teacher who knows how to peer that, to pair that student up with a, 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 another peer, or is able to allow flexibility in the way a student is able to express their understanding of a concept uh, or to support the student in developing understanding about that concept, that can completely change the student's access to the content. And so it's certainly the case that instruction matters and the resources that the teacher has to support students at different levels of both content area knowledge and language proficiency make a difference in terms of students access to the content. 
Uh, but at the same time, if schools have set things up where students aren't allowed to actually enroll or they're discouraged from enrolling in classes uh, because they're not, quote, ready for them, then uh, students who might be quite capable of, of taking that coursework and surviving, uh, you know, it's not just surviving, but passing the course with, uh, with proper instruction, uh, won't, won't even get an opportunity to do so. Any other comments on that particular? I, I suspect Aida has a lot to say about yeah. that. I would encourage yeah. her to say it too. Well, I'll, I'll uh, direct this question She's to you. She's the Aida. instructional person. <laughs> To get you in the mix, because you brought you brought up the word adaptation and flexibility of teachers to kind of meet the student where they're at. And I got another question from uh, Beatrice Arias. Hi, Beatrice. It's good to see you. Uh, she asks, should educators adapt their instruction to address the actual linguistic repertoire of multilingual learners while they learn English? And I think I might anticipate your answer, but Aida, what would you say? Well, it depends on how we understand the concept of adaptation. Uh, I definitely think that teachers have to amplify the ways in which they offer students opportunities to learn. And that is absolutely essential. But, uh, and those mean <coughs> enhancements. It means surrounding students with rich semiotic budgets that enable them to make meaning, construct, notice, collaborate with each other, enrich through participation what they understand. But if adaptations mean simplifications, the answer is a flat no. Uh, it doesn't help anybody to simplify quite the opposite. And this is one of the issues that uh, we know, um, um, unfortunately, preclude long-term English learners from moving ahead. Not only that, from engaging at all. Because if you're treated, you are a teenager, you know a lot about the world, you've traveled through very complex situations to make it to the States, and then you're treated like a child, yeah. then obviously uh, developing uh, an, an antagonistic relationship to school would be granted. And yet we see these students being actually quite nice in school. Um, so, but you know, but they are being underserved and uh, in the name of adaptation. So adaptation is a word or a construct that we need to explain when it's good and when it's bad. Thank you for that nuance. It, it, would anyone else like to comment on that before I move on? I just, I just wanna concur 100% with what Aida said. It's, it's like you wanna teach the content at the highest level and then you help bring the student up to that level by providing additional ways for them to think about and understand what it is that you're trying to communicate to them. But you don't, you don't want to start at the level, a lower level and just stay down there. The whole mm -hmm. idea is to indicate where they need to be and then bring them up to that, to that level of understanding. I, I think of it all the time when I'm teaching graduate statistics courses and I have students with very varied backgrounds in terms of their understanding of those concepts. I don't think that it's really appreciably different from that. They need to understand at the highest level, but how you get them there is, is the challenge. Michael? I, Michael is typing away. I'm and... typing in the <laughs> chat. I'm typing in the q and I'm sorry. See, the young um, people I mean, know how to multitask. I, mean, I, 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 I also, do it. Everything, everything, while I was listening, everything sounded uh, really important, right? Um, you know, sort of the in other work I'm doing, we're 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 very focused on this issue of linguistic repertoire, how to leverage students' entire linguistic repertoire, right? I mean, I think that's like become a very from Aida's work and other folks' work like that. I think that's become a very important central principle. Well, I do need to jump in as the moderator. Um, you can boo me, but this is all the time that we have. This was a wonderful conversation, and I want you to stay tuned because this is not the end. Uh, we will be posting this recording as well as slides and a survey of how we did today on www.cecilcenter.org. I'll put it in the chat so you can click on it now. Uh, the recording, the slides, the survey will be coming out to you later in an email. I do wanna take an opportunity to thank all of our wonderful guests uh, for being here, not just for their work today, but the work over the last few years with getting this center up and running. So um, thank you so much for your time today, Aida, David, Colleen, Kristen, Michael, and Helen. 
And then finally, a big thank you for you, the audience, for joining us for an hour on an afternoon. You could have been doing anything else, but you're with us today. Um, let's uh, let's uh, thank you, you know, uh, do a little round of applause for our virtual audience and make sure that you join us on Mar uh, May 11th. An email inviting you to our next webinar will be coming out uh, in the next week. Thank you thank to you the all. audience and thanks to the other speakers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you next time on May 11th. Okay. Take care and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye now.